On today's show, how Kawhi Leonard can be kept healthy for a postseason run. And Ty Lu and Nico Batum are headed to the gold medal game to face each other. Going to be talking about it all on today's Locked On Offseason Clippers. You are Locked On Clippers, your daily Los Angeles Clippers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, sir. You are locking in with the Clips. Thank you for making Locked On Clippers the first listen of your day, your team every day. I'm your host, Darian Vaziri, born and raised in L.A., and going into my 20th season as a Clipper fan this fall, you can also follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Dime Dropper Pod and subscribe to my own YouTube channel, Dime Dropper, for even more LA Clipper, LA sports, and NBA content. And Locked On Clippers is free and available wherever you get your podcasts, including YouTube, where I want you to let me know what you think we need to do to try to keep Kawhi Leonard healthy for a full postseason run or can he even be healthy for a full postseason run? We're going to be talking about that in this episode. And, of course, checking in with our Olympians, our Clipper Olympians, Ty Lu on the coaching staff, head athletic trainer Jason Powell also on Team USA. I actually want to talk about that later. And then, of course, Nico Batum. But before we do that, this episode is brought to you by FanDuel. America's number one sports book. Head over to FanDuel.com and start making the most out of your summer FanDuel's an official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. All right. So I've wanted to do this episode for a couple of weeks now. I've just been thinking about it. How can the Clippers keep Kawhi Leonard healthy for a full postseason run? Now, of course, all I mean, Kawhi Leonard has always had some injury concerns, but it really began in the 2017-18 season. Because before that, every season but one, including a lockout season, he played 64-plus games. In the 2015-16 season and the 2016-17 season, his first two seasons as an All-Star, he played 72 and 74 games respectively. But then 2018 is when he only played nine games. And that's when it started coming out that Kawhi Leonard has quad tendinopathy. So some kind of disease of the tendon, so to speak, or he's, it can be very inflamed. And that's where the whole he has a degenerative knee stuff started. And I'm not saying when I call it stuff, I don't mean that it's fake or not true. Every, from everything that I've heard, Kawhi Leonard does have a knee issue. I think everybody's seen that, and it's clear by now that he does. But that was, I guess, the medical terminology for it. They were using quad tendinopathy, and that's why he wasn't you know, playing for San Antonio that season. There was that whole controversy about, is he still hurt? I mean, how long could he be hurt? And he had his teammates publicly calling him out and all that. Of course, he gets traded to Toronto. The medical staff of San Antonio and the organization loses Kawhi's trust. There was the whole Uncle Dennis. How much is he involved? Kawhi Leonard gets traded to Toronto. He never said that he was going to be there long-term, never told anyone that he was potentially going to be there long-term. It was everyone knew that him getting traded to the Raptors had the potential of being a rental. Masai Ujiri took the swing in that DeRozan trade. He got rewarded with a championship. But to get that championship, they had to load manage Kawhi, or they agreed with Kawhi's camp and his medical team to load manage him, which was effectively he will not be playing back-to-backs. He will be playing one of those games throughout the regular season. So he played 60 out of 82 games, but he did not play back-to-backs. And in those games, the Toronto Raptors were 41-19, and which is a fantastic record, of course. But you already know the fact that they can go 17 and five without Kawhi is huge because besides DeRozan that the rest of that team 
was already there. You know, they're losing DeRozan, but everybody else, Lowry, you know, Norman Powell, these guys were there. And of course, you know, Pascal Siakam took such a huge leap that season. But Kawhi Leonard was able to play those 60 games. And in the playoffs, and they, they played five games in the first round against Orlando. He played all of them. Seven games against Philadelphia. He played all of them. Six against Milwaukee. And then another six against Golden State. He played and started in all 24 games. He played 39 minutes. And he averaged 30 and a half points to go along with nine rebounds, four assists, two steals, and a block a game on 49, 38, 88 shooting splits in route to a title. I mean, that is an all-time postseason run. But that's really the last time we've gotten to talk about an all-time postseason run that Kawhi has finished. Because five years later after that, five summers later, he's only had one healthy postseason, and it was in a bubble in Orlando, Florida. And so, and I want to just make sure I remind people that in that 2019 run, Kawhi Leonard was limping to the finish line. He did not look great in terms of the way he was moving in those last couple of games. But he's still so good he got the job done, right? We get him. And, of course, that first year, the Clippers were going to load manage him as well. You know, do what they did. You know, and if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And after Kawhi did it, other organizations were like, huh, if we can keep our stars fresh for the playoffs and not take the regular season too seriously and prioritize health, maybe that can happen for us. And it became a league-wide thing. In 2019-20, we load managed Kawhi. And because that was a shortened season, it was only a 72-game season. But he played 57 of those 72 games. So he missed 15. And I remember how frustrated I was in real time before I was the host of this show. Watching those games and being like, we're on a winning streak. And then all of a sudden we lose because our best player is just not playing. And he has the ability to. That was very frustrating for me. Because that was something I'd never experienced. You know, we're, I mean, it's never been a thing in the NBA where you could be healthy just a little bit sore and you don't play before it was like, unless you're really hurt and you're missing multiple games, you're going to, you're going to play. And the medical staff wasn't on this, wasn't proceeding on the side of caution. Of course you have such bigger investments in these players these days, right? Which all contributes to that. But I was frustrated. I can't lie to you. I was frustrated. However, he was able to be healthy in the playoffs because we also had such a huge hiatus when COVID happened. And then of course the rest is history. You know, he looked great in that first round against Dallas. And then the second round was just not something I want to reflect on, but he wasn't good enough. That was definitely Kawhi Leonard's worst moment of his career for sure. Bar none. And like in the playoffs, cause he's such a great playoff player, which brings me to the following year where he didn't actually load manage. And that was the whole thing in this, in that season where they were like, look, we're going to take this a little bit more seriously. We're going to have a little more urgency. Two and three is going to have to set the tone as leaders. They're going to have to be more of communicators because there was a whole conversation about who's the Clipper leader. Do they have a point guard? All that stuff after we lost in such demoralizing fashion at Denver. And Kawhi, you know, did not really load manage that season. And it was working out pretty well. I mean, there were some times in the season where I was like, ah, he looks a little tired towards the end of games. Maybe he shouldn't be playing back-to-backs. But he was fairly healthy that whole season. And then he started having foot problems, started having foot problems towards April and then sat the last two games of the season as rest. But in the last six games of the season, when he returned in May, he only had two games where he had 20 or more and only one game that he had 25 plus points. Then he comes out in the playoffs and just goes absolutely berserk against Dallas. So, by the way, that season was a shortened season too. 72 games, and he missed 20 games. So we tried to not load manage him, and he got injured, but he was ready for the playoffs. But then he got injured again by tearing his ACL. So it was almost there. I mean, he was playing so well. It was too good to be true. We were almost there. And he averaged 30 points that postseason. And then, of course, missed the re- next season. And then this is where it gets to, like, what should we do this year, right? 2023, we load manage and we're proceeding on the side of caution with him coming off that ACL. And he missed 30 games. 30. That's when he wasn't really playing back-to-backs. He only played two back-to-backs. One at the end of the season when we were trying to clinch a playoff spot. 
And then the one where he randomly came out of that game against Memphis, and then they played him the whole next game against New Orleans when we lost both games. So he load managed that season, or we proceeded on the side of caution. And then in the playoffs, he was looking incredible the first two games. In the second half of the season, he was looking incredible. And then he got injured and tore his meniscus. And nobody really knows to this day which exact moment it happened or what exact moment it was when it happened. And then this season we didn't load manage at all. And then he didn't play in the playoffs because of knee inflammation and wear and tear. So what can we do? I'm going to tell you this, right? The whole load management conversation is a very complex one. There is no guarantee that these guys not playing certain games and taking a rest. They are, you know, being on the safer side is going to prevent injury. Cause whenever you step on the court, you can get injured. Now, of course, there is a level of stress that if you're putting too much stress on certain muscles and body parts, you are more prone to injury. However, these players, I mean, I think they can, I think at times organizations are on the cautious side. The pace of the game has increased, yes, the last eight years, but these I mean, these guys don't even full speed practice all the time anymore. Like, come on. Like Paul George even said, and I don't mean to use him as a reference, but Paul George even said that he feels like it's hurting players. So no one quite – and then there was the study that the league released last year, Joe Dumars and crew, that said there's no correlation between load managing and preventing these guys from getting injured. And you know what? Like the injury rate is not down. And by the way, you saw more players playing 65-plus games you added an incentive. So – there is a level of resting going on and stuff like that, which is a big turnoff for some fans, uh, especially old school fans that have been watching the league for a while, which I, I'm not an old school fan, but I was not used to that. I'm not a fan of it as the hosts. I'm, I'm sorry. The listeners of this show. know. but here's the thing. Moral of the story is we load managed Kawhi in 2023 got hurt. Didn't load manage him. And he didn't even get hurt. He had knee inflammation. So we got to really manage that knee. And what I mean by manage that Lee is load manage that knee. He's going to load manage this year. He won't be playing back-to-backs, I don't think. we got to be prepared for that. And we got to take the regular season hit that that comes with. That's the moral of the story. we got to take the regular season hit that that comes with. I was giving you the background, the history of it, because that's the evidence, right, of has load management worked, has it not? I think the, the recent evidence is neither has really worked, but I think you just got to go with – they're going to load manage him this year. Just got to pray for the best. But coming up, the an Olympic check-in. We're going to talk about Kawhi Leonard more at, at, in the final segment, but an Olympic check-in, Nicholas Batum and Ty Lue are headed to the gold medal game to play against each other. Going to be talking about that coming up. I got to tell you a little something about FanDuel. I love sports. I love them so much I never want them to stop. But as the playoffs wind down, we get fewer games, and the sports aren't quite sportsing like I want them to. But FanDuel lets me keep the sports going whenever I want. All I have to do is open the app and dream up bets anytime I'm in the mood. And this summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day all summer long. So head over to FanDuel.com and start making the most out of your summer. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. The conference uh, odds going into the season right now to win the Western Conference, the Clippers literally have, oh, some of the odds have changed. I don't know why, but Clippers are now plus 2,500 to win the conference. Sacramento is even lower. I don't know why. Maybe they know something we don't, but I still think that's a little low for the Clippers, so why not go bet on it? And FanDuel.com is the place where you do. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. Thank you for making Locked On Clippers your first listen of the day. For your second listen, enjoy the Locked On NBA podcast. There is no offseason in the NBA, and Locked On NBA provides daily basketball analysis from national and local experts in 30 minutes or less. No one keeps you as informed and entertained as locked on NBA. Available on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. 
All right. So let's do a little Olympic check-in. USA beat the brakes off of Brazil. Not much to say there. But the semifinal game against Serbia was an all-timer, a classic, a scare for the nation. Ty Lu and Team USA, and of course, Ty Lu's an assistant coach. But by the way, I really think that the conversation around Steve Kerr and the amount of weight that his opinion holds relative to everybody else, as if he's the only one making decisions, is just a really wrong narrative. Everyone just keeps looking at Kerr number one, but he's got a staff of some of the best coaches in the world next to him. You guys don't think that they have any say? Of course, Kerr gets the final say, but you think that he's got something and all the other coaches disagree and he's just going with it? Like, I just have that. I have a hard time believing that. The big controversy in this game was, of course, Jason Tatum again not playing. And we saw that against Serbia the first time in the group stage. He didn't play. And I think a large reason is because they don't want another ball handler out there, a guy that might, and he's not been shooting the ball well, you know, catch and shoot especially. So it's really just another guy that's an on-ball creator, and you have my, you might consider the Ant-Man, and, of course, you have LeBron, better ones. But that was controversial, and you knew if USA had lost to Serbia that, you were going to get everyone piling on Steve Kerr and the coaching staff as a whole. But I honestly don't think the Tatum thing is, is that big a deal. We shouldn't be having conversations about losing games at all, let alone, oh, Jason Tatum not playing as the difference between Team USA losing to Serbia. So credit to Serbia. They came out absolutely raining threes. But what I thought was controversial was that LeBron, Steph, and KD just haven't gone enough minutes together in this Team USA run, and I think that's something the coaching staff has to look at. And in the fourth quarter, it was them three plus Embiid and Booker that made that run, and it was a special run. LeBron got downhill a couple of times. Booker made a couple of threes, but Steph was really the standout in this one for Team USA, knocking down three after three, and you saw the link-ups between LeBron and Steph. LeBron is the trigger man, Steph coming off screens, and the defensive pressure. You know, it's crazy when you talk about any basketball team at any level – when they want to play D, when they have desperation in their body language defensively, that's when everything changes. And when you have a group of players like Team USA, that level of talent, all you need to do is flip a switch. And that flip, that was all, I almost said that flip could have been switched. The switch could get flipped just like that, and you can win a game. And it was too close for comfort, but they got the job done. So Ty Lu and Jason Powell, by the way, for all the people – that say Jason Powell is terrible at his job and he should get fired and he's the reason why the Clippers have so many injuries and that, why their training and medical staff is so bad. Look, I always say that there's way too many cooks in the kitchen to just solely put out all our injury problems on Jason Powell. Part of it is because he's the only remaining piece left over from the Donald Sterling era. So people say, we just got to get rid of all the bad juju from Donald Sterling's era and Jason Powell is the last piece, the last domino to fall. But the fact that team USA has entrusted him by being on their training staff, I mean, he's got to have some kind of cred like, so maybe, I mean, I don't know. I'm not saying that I'm not going to say Jason Powell is great at what he does. Cause I don't know. I am not in the locker room, but he can't be as bad as everybody says is the point. And I really think the blame is misplaced when it comes to that. As far as Team USA, it was a great win. I think they're still going to win gold. But speaking of who they'll be playing against, so congrats to Ty Lu. But speaking of who they're going to be playing against, Nico Batum. First, I want to talk about his performance against Canada. Nico Batum, at age 35, shot only one time in the quarterfinal game against Canada. But he played more minutes than anyone yet again, 34 minutes. He had zero points. But he had five boards, three assists, and a block. And guess who he guarded? SGA. And he did a pretty damn good job. SGA still was 9 for 19 from the field. But he didn't get it super easy. And 9 for 19 is still below 50%. Nico Batum is special. His ability to move his feet still and be a good on-ball point of attack defender is so impressive. And it's really going to help us next season. The fact that France actually beat Canada 
That was impressive. I didn't, I didn't see that coming. And it was a styles make fights kind of game because I've talked about on this show when talking about France, they're all about their front court. Wemby, Gobert, Gershon, Yabasele has become a you know breakout star of this tournament. The thing about Canada is they're a guard-heavy team. SGA, Jamal Murray, Nemhart. That's their strength. But France, their size was just too much. And Nico's point of attack defense was such a huge part of it. So they prevented Canada from even meddling at this Olympics. 82-73 France beating Canada to advance to the semifinals. And what a game we had on Thursday for the semifinals. And Nico was just out of this world good. Out of this freaking world good. The amount of deflections, turnovers forced, tips on rebounds, the little extra effort plays, and Noah Eagle, former Clipper radio announcer, and D. Wade are calling it out in commentary. He's knocking down the three ball. I mean, he only made one three. He was actually only just one for five from three in this game. Three for seven from the field overall but nine points, two rebounds, three assists, a block. That just doesn't go to show you even half of how big his impact can be on the floor. He was guarding Dennis Schroeder more than anyone. And Dennis Schroeder is the star perimeter guy of this German team. I mean, Franz Wagner is their best player. He went completely missing in this game after the first quarter, though, which was similar to what he did in game seven against Cleveland. But the fact that Nico is going from SGA to Dennis Schroeder He's guarding the best guard on the opposing team at age 35. And we're getting him back. <laughs> Let's go. Like, come on, man. You know how excited I am for this guy? I'm going to go get that jersey on Sunday. A blue Nico 33. Let's go. Out here locking up, contesting threes. I mean, his arms are so damn long. And I love that when he's guarding the point of attack, he's getting over screens. He's got his hands active and out to prevent that pocket pass or to make that pass tougher. Young basketball players, I always tell this to my players, active hands, doesn't don't reach necessarily, but have your hands out, make yourself wide, make yourself big. When you're coming, guarding a, a guy in the point of attack, especially at the NBA level or professional level, they love those pocket passes. When you're fighting over a screen, make sure you have, try to get your hand in that passing lane and prevent that pocket pass to make them make a law pass or something that gives your, teammate more uh, time to recover. Nico is top tier at that. And some of his passes in this game were just fantastic. Law pass to Gershon Yabasele, law pass to Wemby, entry pass to Wemby. How about uh, uh, that pocket pass he made on the pick and roll? Uh, I, I think that was in the first half. I mean, it was, it was quite spectacular. It was quite spectacular. Made a three as well, as I said. The amount of times that he just like, well, like you don't get a stat for it, but like knocking the ball off of somebody and if it's off them, after, you know, you deflect it and then it hits them and it goes out of bounds. You don't get a steal for it. You get a deflection for it, but that's not in the box score. He does so much of that kind of stuff. And there's no secret why Nico Batum is in the final. He's earned it being part of this team. And they got a huge win against Germany. 73-69. By the way, that chase down block he had was ridiculous. I mean, <laughs> against Dennis Schroeder. I am so happy to have Nico back. Can you tell? But coming up, going to go back to the Kawhi. So Nico versus Ty Lue in the final. I mean, it's uh, go, go USA all the way. But I'm so happy for Nico because he's going to medal and it's going to be at home. Atmosphere should be great. Definitely we'll do a preview on that game uh, on Friday because that game's on Saturday. So we'll do a segment on that on Friday. But coming up. Let's finish off talking about Kawhi. What else can the Clippers do to prevent injury and to try to get him healthy for a full postseason run? And can he even be healthy for a full postseason run? Going to be talking about that coming up. I got to tell you a little something about better help. This show is sponsored by Better Help. When your schedule is packed with kids' activities, big work projects, and more, it's easy to let your priorities slip. Even when we know what makes us happy, it's hard to make time for it. I wish I could go to the gym more, but sometimes I just don't have the time. I wish I could play basketball more, 
but sometimes I just don't have the time. When you feel like you have no time for yourself, non-negotiables like therapy are more important than ever. And if you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Never skip therapy day with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash LockedOnNBA today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash LockedOnNBA. All right. So talking about Kawhi and how we can keep him healthy next year, I think besides load load management, another thing we need to do is make him go back to the three. I just think maybe less, you know, being boxing out for rebounds, more more less stress on his lower body would be nice. Not boxing out for rebounds as much, not having to go up and contest the rim as much. So getting another big forward would be huge, but I don't know if we're going to do that. I think having Kawhi play the three. I mean, the thing is, though, it's such positionless basketball. Like, it just depends who we're guarding, who we're playing. I think they're going to try to look to put Derek Jones on some bigger guys as well to spare Kawhi at times. I think the goal is to try to put Kawhi on a wing player that's not going to get super involved. But if you're guarding the corner, corner shooter, sometimes you got to be the low man with the spacing of today's NBA. So I don't know. It's just like, to me, it sounds like there's so many things I'm saying, and it, it, I, I feel like I'm running into a wall, and I've hit a wall. I don't know if Kawhi can stay healthy for a postseason run. Like, that's the theme of this episode to me. I truly don't know. The Clippers can try to do all they, all they can, but a lot of it's luck. And I think that's the main thing. Besides load management, besides playing the three, luck. We need some luck. Offensively, he's got a lot of responsibility this year. We don't have Paul George anymore. Don't have Russ anymore. It's J James Harden and Kawhi's show. And if James Harden misses any games, that might be even worse than Kawhi missing games this year. Because James Harden has a level of playmaking and floor raising that he's an all-time great at that. Kawhi, he absolutely, when he's on the court, he gives you a level of just seriousness and the ability to score and defend. And, you know, we know who Kawhi is. He's one of the greatest winners that we've ever seen. One of the highest win percentages the game has ever seen. But James Harden's ability to just create good shots and be a one-man offense, that can help him when you have stars missing game and he's got to carry an offensive load. And against bad teams, even now he can still do it. In his prime, he can do it against anyone. So my point is Kawhi's going to have a lot of stress offensively. And I love that we brought in Nico and Derek Jones and Chris Dunn, and we still have Terrence Mann, to take that load off of him defensively. But offensively, he and James Harden are going to have to create everything. And, of course, you know we'll see what we do with our bench. Uh, point guard situation, but that's going to be an episode for uh, next Monday, probably. So by the way, I know I apologize for the, the, the multiple days with no episodes in between. I'm going to try to be more consistent about Monday, Wednesday, Friday, but remember August, it, we have gone down to three episodes a week. So that is our, our thing. And man, I need, I need the time. I need the break, but it's not really a break. We're still bringing you episodes three days a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. It was my goal. If you don't get an episode on a Wednesday, or a Monday, that means definitely you'll get it the next day. No more than that. So, but I will try to do Monday, Wednesday, Friday. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Dime Dropper Pod. Subscribe to my own YouTube channel, Dime Dropper, for even more LA Clipper, LA Sports, and NBA content. And Locked On Clippers, free wherever you get your podcasts. Make sure you listen if you can't watch the video on YouTube, where you should subscribe and hit the notification bell to get this channel up to 6,000 subscribers because Clipper Nation is one of the most loyal fan bases in sports. We got to show everybody that with the subscriber count on YouTube. The age-old proverb continues, go Clippers.